Hello and welcome to another episode of On The Cube Leadership Podcast, where we take a look at things that are happening in everyday events, in the news, across across the globe, and see how we can interpret them to, for leadership lessons, so we can become better leaders, so we can learn from the, the mistakes or maybe the good things that leaders are doing across the planet, so that we may don't make the, maybe don't make the same mistakes, but also possibly can make sure we I think all of that was terrible grammar, but I think, I hope that you get what I'm saying. Look, we just want to become better leaders. I hope as you as a leader have inside of you the desire to constantly want to grow. I'm assuming because you're watching this video, you too will be desiring to become a better leader. And so we just want to look at what, what people are doing, good or bad, uh, we take lessons from the both. Now. As leaders, there is one thing I can guarantee you. I can guarantee you that you're going to make mistakes. I can guarantee you that you're going to face accusations. I can guarantee you that you are going to have people against you. But as a leader, it is how you respond to those accusations, how you respond to those mistakes, how you respond to things. That is what actually sets you apart. It's not the mistakes. It's not not making mistakes because no person is free of mistake. There's one person, his name's Jesus, and that's the only person that is free of mistakes. But we as leaders are full of mistakes and we make big mistakes and we can face accusations. Now, sometimes those accusations are true, sometimes they're not. And so we're gonna take a look at a couple of different you know, events that are happening you know, across the, I suppose the uh, hot topics at the moment of, of things that are happening in the news to see how we can learn how to face accusations, how we can respond in a way, whether it's, whether it's something we've done wrong or whether it's something that we are, with, that we are, are not to blame for because I can tell you, I've been accused of things in my, in my leadership that are completely not true. And it's the way that we respond to those things that actually sets us apart. Maybe in the moment it might be hard, but I guarantee you in the long run, making sure you respond the right way to accusations, whether true or not, makes a massive difference for your future. And as leaders, that's what we're all driving towards. It's not about a short-term game. It's about making sure you stay true to your leadership call, to your leadership purpose long term. And so to help me out with these conversations, as always, is the businessman's pa business pastor, businessman and businesswomen's pastor, Dr. Rod St. Hill. Welcome, Dr. Rod St. Hill. Thank you for joining us. It's great to join you again, mate. I really enjoy our times together. So um, this... <laughs> Last week, just before we started this podcast, you said, well, last week got me thinking when we were talking a lot about the end times and some, some really controversial things that happened. Today, we've got some controversial things to talk about as well, some really hotbed topics. So I hope that while you're watching this, you can take this for what it is. Please understand, we don't know the whole story. We don't claim to be journalists. We don't claim to know all the facts. And in, in a lot of these things, no one knows other than the people that are literally involved. And so please take that into consideration as we're discussing these topics, that what we wanna do is we wanna draw on these as metaphors and see what we learn from the outside, what we actually know from the outside of what we can learn to, to be better leaders. But Dr. Rod, Let's just, let's jump straight into the first one. Let's jump straight into the first one. Trigger warning? I don't know whether it really is, but it's gonna, it's a hot topic of Russell Brand. Russell Brand has been across the media. Now, we know that Russell Brand is, is a, uh, is a controversial top, you know, character. Anyway, now, he's been quite vocal about his, let's say, poor choices when it comes to um, his life choices in the past. He looks to have recently been on a path for truth and um, and trying to actually speak out and, and, and do, speak against the negative things that are happening in the world. However, he's been hit with this, with accusations of sexual assault. Now, 
there's an I think there's a number of things that have that have happened or that that have happened with this that I think we can respond to. Um, there was a documentary that was that was recently released that kind of a couple of anonymous women have uh, have made accusations uh, against Russell Brand and his um, that he se- that he uh, sexually assaulted them and and uh, and yeah so. I think first of all, actually, Dr. Rod, Yash, can you take that off the screen just for a moment, just for a moment? I want to, from a pastor's point of view, I do want us to address this, this straight up about victims in this sort of a situation, because there's, there's both sides of the party. There's, you know, there's victim shaming of these people that are just trying to get money or trying to you know, get fame or, or whatever. And then there's the other side of, well, you know, there needs to be safety for victims to be able to to be able to speak out and encouragement. How do you suggest or how would you because obviously we don't support this behavior at all. Like that like if if it's true, these accusations, if you know, sexual assault, rape, all that sort of stuff and any victim of, we don't want to diminish that at all, but how would you, what would you say leading into discussing a, a, a hot topic like this? Well, if you're talking about what you do as a pastor, if somebody comes to you with a story, as you do with anybody's story about anything, you start out by believing them. Now, it's very different when it gets into the legal system. That's a different Um, I was going to say a different kettle of fish. I don't know whether everyone will understand that expression, but it's different when it gets into the legal system. But if somebody's coming to you as pastor or if someone comes to you as a counsellor or a psychologist, I, I believe the best way to approach it initially is to believe the story. Now, look, that can apply if it's something to do with sexual assault. It can apply in any area whatsoever. If somebody comes to me and says, I'm depressed, well, my inclination is to believe them initially, and we work through it. If someone comes to me and says, I'm the victim of sexual assault, my inclination is to believe them, and then start working through some steps that we might use to address that issue. It is very different when it gets to the legal system, Um, because one obviously needs to be sceptical in a healthy sense and to investigate on the basis of what facts can be ascertained. But if someone comes to me as a pastor, the first thing I do is believe them. Um, Mm -hmm. It may turn out ultimately that they're deceived or they're mistaken, but you really can't help somebody initially unless you say, yep, okay, I receive that, I understand how you feel, uh, and I do believe your story. And then we move on from there. Now, I, I really like that. That's great wisdom. So if someone, as a leader, like you mentioned pastors and counsellors, but I think as leaders, if we're in a leadership position, usually we have people that do confide in us and that they do trust us and look up to us. So as leaders, we do have people that come and, and share things. I think that that's, that's a really good um, thought of, you know, let you know, let's just the default is let's believe them. However, one thing that goes through our mind is I, I just kind of want want to clear up like the definition maybe of believing them and their story doesn't mean you grab the pitchforks and torches and then go and try to hunt down. No, like, not the, at all. Like, look, like how how do you balance that kind of yeah, because obviously as a leader, you have to take action on that somehow. But how do you approach it while still believing them, but without falsely well, you know, okay. blaming someone there are else? Different, there are different leadership situations. What I was talking about was the situation where someone comes to me as their pastor or perhaps yeah. to a psychologist as their psychologist. I think once something gets out in the public arena like this, it's a fairly different kind of situation. And also in a lot of leadership situations where there may be an allegation, say, of bullying or um, harassment or something like that, hopefully the organisation has processes 
and you should take great care in making sure that those processes first are established on an appropriate basis and then that they are actually used. So you do have to be quite careful in that situation. Um, so, and, and look, there are processes. I think in something like the Russell Brand case, ideally, this would ultimately be settled through the, the, the legal and justice systems. Mm -hmm. Early days, yep, we'll have to see where this goes. But definitely nothing should ever be decided in the court of public opinion. And we have to be so very, very careful that we can avoid that because great damage can be done to either side of a story, actually, if if the public opinion ends up being the the, the place in which um, yeah. one, or, one thing or another is determined. So let's talk about that then. It has, it is in... <laughs> It is in the you know, trial by media now, like even though it's, it is you know, going through the legal system, it is trial by media at the moment. And Russell Brand is being, uh, he does have accusations made against him. Now, a couple of actions that, that we can see is number one is Russell Brand came out before any of this stuff came public and made a very short, concise statement. Uh, links to, uh, we, always, we always link everything below um, that we're kind of referring to. There was actually a, a, a report by, the, I was just showing you before, um, Piers Morgan was reporting it, that link's down below. But also there's a link to uh, Brett Cooper uh, from the comment section. She commented about it and she played his video within that. So. Go and check out that and, and, and her take on that, which which I thought was good. So him coming out ahead of the story, good, bad? Like, is that what we should do? It depends. I think it depends on a lot of things. Um, he obviously has made a public statement to the effect that uh, he denies those allegations. He flatly denies them. And look, I think given the fact that he's a public figure, there is some point in doing that. My own inclination is to just keep mum about it, but I'm not a public figure. <laughs> you know, I don't have the kind well, of... Well, you are now, that. Dr. Rod. You are well, YouTube yeah. famous now. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, I'm, I'm not critical of what he did, but what I would say is I just don't think there's a hard and fast rule we can apply in a case like this. So I don't feel uncomfortable at all about what he did, but what I am saying is you have to take it case by case. Yeah, okay, all right. So then let's move on to the court of public opinion. Something does get out in, in, into the public. Now, I know we're talking about Russell Brand and this is worldwide, right? Like, and, and so media coverage. But a lot of us live in our own little worlds where there are, you know, it can go viral kind of in our own little world, what, whatever the thing is. How do we respond? How do we, as leaders, handle ac public accusations about something that is actually really private and should be dealt with in private and, and, and maybe has due process to go through? How do we, because I'm sure there's there's leaders that have been accused even just in their own workplace or in their church or, or whatever, their circle of friends, they've been accused of things that uh, I'm not, that, that may be true, may not be true. How do you respond to that? Look, it, it, I think it's probably one of the most difficult decisions a person would ever have to make. Do I go public and defend myself or do I stay mum? And mm -hmm. just see what happens, say through through legal challenge uh, through legal channels. Yeah. I, I this is a the kind of thing in which I would almost certainly seek some legal advice mm. and be guided. I'd go find a Christian lawyer if I don't already have a relationship with a Christian lawyer, and and seek their advice because, look, these are the kinds of things that can get caught up in the legal system, and it's very expensive as well 
as a general rule, I would say don't react quickly. Mm. Second, if you have the media on your doorstep, you have absolutely no obligation to anybody in the media to respond to their questions. You I, need to I, get that straight in your mind. You yes. owe the media nothing. Actually, I want to I kind of you, you go a little bit deeper than that because you say if they turn up on your new doorstep, you don't have to, you don't have to say anything. Um, guys, you may not have the media coming to you, but you're bringing social media to you right now in this. And there's so many people that are very quick to jump on and record a video and, and share it out with the media. Like they're defending because there's some accusations or whatever. Um, I think that, that that's very good. You have no, no obligation to speak to the media. That goes for social media as well. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> We've got no obligation to respond to any comments anybody makes about these videos, for example. Yeah. And um, I don't. I, one reason is I'm too busy. Most of the time I'm too busy to read them, let alone respond to them. But I do think we Until need to Until next that. week. Until, Until next week. week. We've got our one-year anniversary for our podcast, and we're actually going to go through some of our viral videos and respond to some of the things. So look out for that. Well, we might um, do it then. But, 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 yeah. but look, I, I, I do think you, do, you, need, you need to know long before any crisis arises, you've got no obligation to the media, you've got no obligation to the legacy media, nor do you have any obligation to social media. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. How do you... One other thing that's actually happened in, in this story is the the British government or someone, a, a minister in the British Correct. government yeah. has written letters to YouTube, Rumble, Twitter, I'm pretty sure. And, and, and like, so so a lot of media outlets saying, what are you doing to demonetize him? Now, there's mm. one thing that's, that's being mentioned on, on a lot of the commentaries that I'm noticing is it's really interesting that they're targeting his monetization not his influence, but they're not saying you should take him down. They're saying you should stop him from earning money. But YouTube, which YouTube have, YouTube have demonetized him, but YouTube are still making money from they're him. Still running ads. Yes, that's right. That's like right. Ev everyone's still making money from him, but happy to. Th so it's an attack, kind of like on his, on his, you know, livelihood and things like that. First of all, from the minister's point of view. Like, I don't know, that, it seems like a little bit of an overreach of power, but also... Oh, it is. It's improper, what, and I think it's an abuse of power. Absolutely. Quite improper. Quite improper. Yeah. Uh, and it leads me to think about what's the... Yeah, we talk about the separation of church and state, but how do we balance that separation of business and government? <laughs> well, look, that's a difficult thing. I, I, I don't think this is really an issue of separation between business and government. This is a question about whether or not the action taken by the minister was, was a proper thing to do, and I don't think it was. Um, yeah. And I don't think it was proper for, for uh, YouTube to demonetize Russell Brand either. But I also think it's highly hypocritical of them to continue to make money from the adverters. And as you say, uh, YouTube continues to profit from um, his uh, uh, Russell Brand's uh, influence, mm -hmm. but isn't, uh, you, you know, isn't releasing any money to him. I, I think that's improper as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just so wrong. Uh, I, I note that Rumble have basically said, no, look, we're not going to demonetize him. And I think that's the right thing for the time being because um, there's nothing's happened in the courts. As far as I know, there are no charges being laid. I, I understand that at least some of the people who were interviewed in that um, Channel 4 documentary have gone to the police, but, but I'm just not sure what, where things have gone from yeah. from there but that um uh piers morgan uh interview that that you had up on the screen a little while ago that yeah. is worth watching uh the whole lot of it i think it runs for about 15 minutes or so uh, seven 18 oh, that minutes. 18 yeah that's definitely worth watching and, and i think you need to weigh up really carefully the comments made by his guests there yeah 
mm-hmm. and um, yeah, I won't uh, I won't spoil it for anybody. But I really do think that if you've got an interest in this matter or anything like it, I'd thoroughly recommend that you take a look at that video. Yeah. Now, as a leader, we're talking about responding to accusations. Some of those accusations can affect your 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 ability to earn, your ability to provide for your family, like those sorts of things, which it, it is for him. Luckily, he has a, has money. They've had, he's had, they've had to cancel. They've, he's had a lot of his shows and everything like that. Yes, he tours has. and mm. tour dates cancelled and or postponed um, for now. But how do we, if we are in, if we're in this space of these accusations affecting our ability to make money and things like that. How? What do we do as a leader? What should we do as a leader when we are when we're facing things where people are taking away our ability to make money? Like, what do we do in that situation? Well, I think perhaps there's a question that should come before that, and that is, what have you done? Mm. So for somebody like Russell Brand, whose lifestyle was a lifestyle that most people would not approve of, Mm -hmm. I'd say probably 90% of people wouldn't approve of it, Um, he needs to take in, well, anybody like him, you need to take into consideration what risk might be attached to you developing um, a public profile through social media. Yeah. So, you know, if he's got publicists and even lawyers and so on, on a team, one of the things they ought to have done is undertake a risk analysis before he even bothered to engage uh, in social media, knowing that him having had sexual relationships with so many women, he says they were all consensual, and we've got no idea of knowing whether his perception is the same of, as that of, of all of the women <laughs> yep. with whom he had sexual relationships, and who knows how their own perceptions might have changed over time, as indeed societal attitudes have changed over time. But you yep. see that the risk to his ability to make money in social media, that should have been taken into account a long time ago. I have no idea whether or not it was. And the way in which he ought to have been um, you know, building sort of financial buffers and so on in the event that something like this does happen, that should have all been taken care of long ago. And what you do from this point on, if you haven't built into your calculations some kind of risk analysis, that's a really tough one because if suddenly he's without income and he doesn't have any financial resources, he hasn't been building up some kind of um, asset portfolio as he's been drawing income from things like his YouTube channel and so on, that's a really tough one. And, um, you know, you're in the same situation then as anybody who's simply run out of money. And I, I don't know what his personal situation is, and actually it's none of my business anyway, but um, if, if look, it, it's like any business. You've got to undertake some risk analysis and you need to do everything that you can to mitigate those risks. And I just hope he has. I have no idea whether he has. I hope he's had people advising him who are aware that this is what you do when you're setting up any business. You've got to take into account all kinds of risks. And for somebody whose income earning capacity is dependent upon their social media profile, then the risk that someone from their past uh, might do something to ruin it has to be taken into account. That's really good. Now, I want to jump on a bit of a conversation that you and I had off air before. Um, because Russell Brand, he he's confessed to his mistakes. He's confessed to the fact that he had addictions and he's changed his life and he's, mo- he's changed his life around now and, and he's a different person and, and everything like that. And he's commended. He's, he's, his behaviour definitely has changed. Shouldn't he be forgiven then? Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but sometimes you nevertheless face consequences. Mm, and yeah, like uh, before we went on air, we were talking about King David and, and how clearly he transgressed God's law. Mm-hmm. And um, but, but God forgave him. However, he certainly suffered consequences through a dysfunctional family. And yep. he, he died a sick man. Mm. We're not sure what the sickness was, but we know he was very ill 
when he died. So, and, and of course, the son that was uh, his first son through Bathsheba died. So yeah. there was still, as it were, a price to pay, yeah. despite the fact that he'd received forgiveness from from God. And I think that's something that we have to understand, that yes, God forgives us, absolutely. And yes, we forgive one another, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there are now no consequences. Yeah, that's really good. I, I, I like that and I, because I want to emphasize that because I think that's really important for us to know is we, we, we all make mistakes and, and yes, we can we can turn our lives around after making mistakes and we can we can we can improve and we can admit our admit, admit our mistakes and move on and, and try to do better for the world and, and try to do good things for the world. But understand, even though we may be forgiven by those around us, maybe be forgiven by our family or friends or, or, or even you know our, our, our influence circle and be forgiven by God, it doesn't remove the fact that we still have to admit that there is risk of facing consequences at some point. There will always be consequences. Just because we admit that we're wrong, yes, we've done the right thing by admitting we we're wrong, but we still have to be man enough. Now, that, that might be a little bit sexist or whatever, but we have to be man and woman enough to stand up and just go, yep, I made a mistake. Um, this is how I've changed. But if there's consequences, I'm still willing to face the consequences of it. So, and there was a bunch more in that that I just don't think <laughs> there was so much in that. Remember, you don't have to respond to the media. If you're facing accusations, if you're going through some trials, don't feel like the first thing you need to do is pick up your phone and 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 blast out a live to the world and, and and say to them, look, this is what I've done wrong and this is what I haven't done wrong. And you know, like like you don't have to. You don't owe anyone. You don't owe anyone an explanation. And the other thing that obviously we spoke about with this is but one thing, beautiful thing that Dr. Rod said is when someone comes and confides in you, probably the best advice is to make, just make sure you trust them. First of all, just trust what they've said and then make sure you follow due process. So if you're a leader, make sure you have that due process set up before you face challenges rather than trying to make it up on the go because it won't work. So probably advice to people right now, if you're a leader and you don't have a proper process set out of how you handle when someone comes and shares a challenge with you, a personal challenge or something's happened in the workplace or whatever the situation be, make sure you have your due process, your, your proper systems and procedures set up so you can follow those things so that you don't overstep boundaries, you don't, you know, inadvertently sweep things under under the wrong th rug that you're trying to avoid but you make sure you handle it properly a lot there a lot there and that's why we took almost half an hour to talk about that one topic <laughs> so thank you once again dr rod that was great wisdom great wisdom but let's 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 shift our focus let's shift our focus to i want to i want actually <laughs> It's not too often that we get to highlight good leadership. And when we're talking about facing accusation, this next story may not it may not really fall within the the guise of responding to accusations, but it's definitely responding to challenges. And there were some accusations of Red Bull's performance. Now, this is now a little bit old news because I wanted to talk about it last week and then we had a great topic last week, so I kind of got put on the back burner, but I wanted to share this that uh, there was this interview, and link is below in description, but there was this interview by Sky News, uh, that were, or Sky Sports, that was interviewing Christian Horner, who is the Red Bull, um, <clears throat> not CEO, he's the Red Bull Chief Engineer, Managing Director, man Team Manager. <laughs> I Maybe think I he's CEO like, of the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good enough that. description. <laughs> That's it. He's the leader. He's the leader. Yeah. He's the one that runs. He's the run. The guy that runs the show. Now, um, if Singapore at Singapore GP. Now, if you, Red Bull have won like the last twenty-two out of their last twenty-three races, and um, and then this year they have won 
every single race, I think. Think. They've run every single race this year, and Max Verstappen. They've already they've already won the the constructors championship, and like they they they're doing great guns. This is just a sta- standout year for them. Any any sports fan to be able to watch this season, no matter what sport you follow, it's just enjoyable to see a team just absolute absolutely on their game, absolutely on their game, and dominate every single race until Singapore. And at Singapore, Red Bull did not even make it out of qual- the second qualifying round. Um, they had real problems. They had problems with the car set up and everything like that. And there's all these accusations that, well, it's because they were cheating the rules and there was new rules that were, came in. Um, you know, they call them TDs, tech, technical directives. They're constantly changing in F1. And they, they brought in some new rules that, that apparently now there's a, these accusations against Red, against Red Bull that, well, because they were, they, were, they were cheating the system and this is now proof that they, that they haven't, um, that they weren't following the rules and everything like that. So it, I'm telling you, this is, this is a, a, you know, a little bit old because since this race in Singapore, last week they were in um, Japan and... They absolutely dominated and 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 won hands down again, and you know, so it was crazy. But what I felt was really interesting with this interview, and link in description, go and watch this video. They're challenging uh, Christian Horner against setup and drivers and you know management and 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 all those sorts of things, but. The way that he responds to all the accusations, all the challenges, I think demonstrates really good leadership. And it's very rare that we actually get to see public demonstration of good leadership. There's a couple of things you, that he does while you're, if you're watching this, uh, this interview. One, he's, he's actually very calm, very controlled. He has a great presence. He he just he delivers everything confidently. He talks technically, so he knows what he's talking about. He, he obviously comes across as an expert and authority of what he's saying. But the key that I see here that sets him apart in this moment is he not once, not once did he blame anything, a person or a thing. He did not blame anyone for driver error, which the drivers made some mistakes in their in their qualifying. Um, the the setup, he didn't blame the team for the wrong setup. Didn't blame the 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 change in the tech in the technical directives. He didn't he didn't blame the condition. Didn't blame the tires. He all what he did is he kept saying, "We need to figure out this problem. We." We, we kept kept including himself and the team, but in, throughout the whole time he had complete faith in his team. He kept emphasizing that the te- you know, the team the team are great. The, I, I've got you know they're like, well, how are you going to overcome it? He's like, we've got a great team. They're a great team. They're going to overcome it, no problems. And so I think it's awesome that how he delivers this. Um, his response to everything, even the fact that there was an issue with the tires not not reaching like their optimum window, he's even just talking about rather than blaming the tires, he's like, oh, we weren't able to find that optimum window for the tire and, and things like that. It was just, I thought it was absolutely beautiful and a and a perfect demonstration of good leadership and how you respond to accusations and challenges. He included himself, he he encouraged his team, he had complete confidence and faith in his team. He spoke up how awesome they were and how good they were, and he addressed the issues without blaming anything. I, I'm sorry, I went on a bit of a rant there because I thought I was, I when I saw this, I was just almost jaw to the floor because you don't see this too often. Dr. Rod, what was your take when you saw him uh, respond to these things? Uh, pretty much the same, actually. I, I watched that interview and I thought how, how measured his responses were. He was articulate. I don't think I heard him say um or ah uh, once yes. in that interview. So he was clearly in possession of the facts. And um, he, he presented factually, as it were. He didn't divulge anything that might have happened privately because he might have had 
some conversations yes. with some people in the technical <laughs> team. He might have had some conversations with the drivers, mm -hmm. but he didn't divulge anything that happened privately, which I think was a very good thing. The other thing I would note, though, too, is those three interviewers, they were actually good interviewers as well because they displayed a good level of inquisitiveness, but yes. they weren't aggressive. And yes. uh, I, 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 so I thought both sides of that interview, the interviewers and the interviewee, um, they, they were all highly professional. They were informative because we're left with no misunderstanding as to what the issues were, mm -hmm. but there was no attempt by anybody actually in that interchange to level blame at anybody uh, individually. If there was anyone to blame individually or a number to blame, then that was done in private and kept in private. And I think that was totally appropriate for this kind of thing. Uh, it's, I, I'm really glad you brought up those the the reporters because I I agree with you, but I didn't I didn't make note of that until you said it. I was like, yes, you're absolutely right. They were hard. Like, they, like oh, yeah. they, they kept asking some of the, like repeated some of the questions a couple of times to try to try to break him. So they were doing they were doing uh, their job, but they were also they were respectful. They were right. They were. Mm. But also, like they were researched. They they came with the right amount. Of, yeah, I think that dare I say this should be. Uh, the interview that should go down in the history books of interviews that for both parties, this is an ideal it's interview. It's a good case study. It's a very <laughs> good, good case, case study. study, my word. Um, and, and actually, the funny thing about this is this is at a sporting event. This is live. This is, this, like, this was after qualifying. They're still, everything's still going on. It's not like this is a week later, they had time to research, they had time to sit down and prepare their questions and their answers and everything like that. Like, this is like in the heat of the moment. Now, obviously the reporters would have prepared a little bit, but it's not like they had days to do it and teams of in teams of interviewers to, to um, or teams of researchers to, to do that. And Christian Horner wouldn't have had his time to, to, to do that either. Yeah, I think that this is this was a great example, and that's why I wanted to bring it up because we're talking about facing accusations as leaders, and I think that this kind of demonstrates a great way to be able to respond to those things. Be measured. Don't blame. Don't point the finger at people. Don't don't try to blame things and and you know change the situations or the FIA or whoever it is. And he um, didn't make any excuses either, did he? No. That no, was, he did not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a very good interview. I th I felt. Actually, another thing that I that really stood out to me was, this was a team that was on, on track to win every single race this year, and and to be like you know to be, continue to break records. And Max Verstappen is now, he did ten in a row, ten in a row. I think it was that broke the record last last. Uh, last GP and it was just an expected it was just continue on this very you know and there was no there was no how do I say it romanticism about like oh we lost this this fairy tale thing and oh no it's awful but there was none of that that they weren't clinging to 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 a, a perfect result they're expecting mistakes and you know challenges and failures and like they've now lost that fairy tale kind of you know story but there wasn't it they, they weren't crying you know they weren't you know wallowing in their tears so to speak for that so what would you say dr rod then to a team, a leader, who their teams are... Look, it'd be great. Wouldn't it be awesome to be leading a team that is winning right now? Like, that is just winning like Red Bull. Like, everything's everything's win, 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 win. What do you say to a leader that has a team that are just on a streak and then they have a loss? 
because that can really mess up morale. That can really mess up motivation. That can really mess with a team. Like, and it, you know, we hear about people, you know, they can just have one loss and then they just go into a slump because they're they're riding on their high and then all of a sudden they lose their identity in always winning and things like that. What would you what would you say to a leader that is leading a team of winners? that have a failure how do you help them look past that failure well failure is a pretty tough thing <laughs> there's no doubt about it but I, I think in the case of a sporting code the kind of thing we're talking about here i do think you need to be analytical mm -hmm. try to identify the issues that led to that disappointing result but importantly identify what you can do in order to improve next time yeah in other words you do have to analyze the past but you do need to develop a very strong focus on the yep. future so it really hinges on so what can we learn from this negative experience mm -hmm. what can we do differently next time that will produce a better result but I don't Actually, see a lot of point, you, you know, often um, after a sporting game when the, the coaches and so on are, or the captains are, are interviewed, they will tend to blame. Yes. And I think that's something to be avoided as leaders. Let's not do that. Let's not blame weather conditions or the referee or, or anything. I think the attitude should be, you know what, we didn't get the result we wanted, so we're going to analyse that and we're going to build some strategies so that we don't fall into those same traps or mistakes next time and we fully anticipate that we're going to get back onto our winning streak pretty quickly i like i like what you're talking about about looking in the future because there's one thing that that they did in this interview which was started talking about japan uh, asuka asuka i think the the track's called or where whatever the track is called i'm sorry if i'm butchering it i enjoy f1 i not like a devout fan when I know everything about it. Just just see what's what's happening. Um, they were asking about looking forward because yeah, what do you do looking forward? And obviously now that race has been this weekend, and they they definitely overcame it because because they were they were actually they in their pre race simulations they actually expected that their car would struggle in Singapore and in Japan, so that they. they obviously we're expecting two two races to not go well for them they did fix it and that's the good thing like they looked forward and they did fix it because obviously they won last weekend but one interesting thing that i found christian horder to say in this in this interview is they asked him about what are you going to change for japan what are you doing looking forwards and he just kept saying we're still in the middle of this weekend Yes, we've got a bad result, but we've still got to race to race tomorrow. We've still got to do our best tomorrow. And I thought it was really good that, yes, even in, a, in the middle of a failure, we do need to look forward, but not at the expense of what we're doing now. We still have a responsibility for what we're doing right now to keep working on. We can't just go, well, this weekend's a loss. Let's just throw it out the window and pack up and leave. They didn't do that. They kept fighting. They... I think Max ended up getting up to about a fifth position, I think he ended, um, fifth or sixth, I, th I think it was. So they still try to fight hard for, for, for that weekend while still looking forward to, for the future. So I think that's, that's a good lesson is while you're in the middle of something, if you, if you are in the middle of a loss, sometimes, sometimes don't throw in the towel. You do have to, you can't just throw everything away because you still have responsibilities Maybe you maybe you're working on a project and and it's you know, it's falling apart. You don't just go well stuff that client. I'm not gonna not gonna do anything more for that client. I'm just gonna move on. Finish it out. It may not be as awesome as you can, but finish it out. Do what you can, and then start looking forward to the future. Fix as much as you can in the moment. But as a leader, this is a perfect example. Make sure you're not blaming anything. Make sure you are you are controlled. Make sure you're researched. Make sure you know what you're talking about, but don't blame. Acknowledge the problems, but also don't blame. And as a leader, one of the biggest lessons we can learn is use the word we rather than pointing the finger at anyone or anything in particular. Now, talking about 
uh, responding to claims. So we have, now let me, let me pull this up. We have another, another video by Brett Cooper. All of the articles we, we talk about, all the, all the links are, are, in, are in the description. Jimmy Fallon. Now, he has, I know we've spoken about him before. I may, we not, may not agree with his politics or, or whatever, but he's now been, been uh, accused of having a toxic work environment. He's been accused of being drunk on set, being aggressive, being, you know, treating people badly, that there's eight showrunners in eight years that have quit. And there's people coming out saying that there's all this bad stuff about Jimmy Fallon and all, all this, um, all this, all these challenges. Now, Jimmy Fallon responded. We talk about like, should you respond or should you not? Jimmy Fallon responded and he just said, hey, look, I'm sorry. The last thing I wanted is I don't. I want it to be a happy environment. I want it to. I want it to be a positive place, an inclusive place for everyone. I. I, I didn't want anyone to be hurt. So, I suppose there's accusations of being a toxic work environment. First thing we spoke about this before. Do you come out? Do you not come out? Do you think it was right that Jimmy Fallon? came out and apologized in this way um you know if he did come to me for advice <laughs> and why would he but if he did i'd probably say look you know this is something between you and those individuals um if you feel it's appropriate to apologize then go and do it to them mm. i really generally speaking i wouldn't recommend that you do anything on social media mm. Honestly, because look, this is not a stage performance or anything like that. I, I just think it's really unfortunate that we tend to think that because somebody has a public profile, that they have to answer to all of us individually, mm -hmm. and that somehow or other we're all supposed to, re, you know, be part of um, this great voyeur <laughs> voyeur show, and um, you know, watch on and occasionally comment. Um, who knows? Look again, we've got no idea. As mm -hmm. social media observers, we've got no idea what the truth is. And you, you must never draw a conclusion either by the volume of comments one way or the other on mm -hmm. social media. Um, honestly, because, the, see, the cost of making a comment on social media is next to nothing. Yes. So people can say things and they're not, they've really got very little to, to lose. They don't, they've got no obligation to do any research or even to think carefully before they put finger to keyboard yeah so a, 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 as a general rule i wouldn't rec i wouldn't recommend making a public apology and in any case as uh, brett cooper noted and many others have noted the apologies can go on and on and on and on it's not going to make any difference yes if 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 the um swell of public opinion on social media goes against you it doesn't make any difference what you do it's not going to make any difference so um, the general rule would be keep it private if you've got anyone you genuinely believe you should be apologizing to do it privately yeah. and it, it, look if they choose to make something public i guess that's 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 their their business and and so on but look the the media as as you know it, it's it's a difficult job yeah um very very i mean to, to do a, a nightly tv show like uh, jimmy fallon has done i think they're not doing too much just now because they haven't got anyone to write the script but <laughs> uh, um, we've talked about that before as well um it's high pressure mm -hmm. it's very difficult to judge the difference between a high pressure workplace that you go into with your eyes open and a toxic workplace um you know so that got... actually brings up a good point because i wanted to ask you this because what's the difference uh, look let's be honest both you and i we've spoken about this at, about this at length that we have previously both worked within toxic environments we've both been under you know under toxic leadership and all that sort of stuff but i would understand like you mentioned like it's a late time late night show and and I'm assuming that stuff is really high pressure and it's it's on the ball. There's lots going on. There's a whole lot of pressure. A lot of people, a lot of, a lot of you know, 
you know, contributing factors and, and moving parts and everything like that, I would say that it would be a very, and you're dealing with a lot of egos and you're dealing a lot of, a lot of different characters and everything like that. What's the difference between a high pressure environment versus a toxic environment? Oh, <laughs> it's like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I think it's, it's <laughs> something which is pretty difficult to to um, to make that demarcation. But I would characterise a toxic environment as one in which there is repeated behaviour. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if 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 you have a manager who loses his or her temper on a regular basis, and I'm talking here about say three or four times a week. Yeah, that would I think point to a toxic culture. If yep. somebody loses their cool, maybe once a month or once every three months or something, because there's a combination of things that go wrong, technically, or suddenly a script isn't there, or you know someone doesn't do their job properly, and someone loses their temper. Look, I I think sure there's an occasion perhaps to apologise, but I don't think that is a toxic work culture and the reason being it's not culture yeah yes yes that's 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 good um because just because it happens doesn't mean it's the culture it's it's a culture is when something is repeatedly happening and it's, and that's it's right. something that's embedded and and what you notice is that we talk we talk about uh um talk uh, about culture it all comes from the top and and it should flow on and so a culture doesn't mean that one person is getting upset. A culture, you know, is everyone's doing whatever that, that culture is that you're talking about. So how do we as leaders make sure that... Because I get... We've all, we've all heard this before. A lot of leaders leading incredible organisations. And, and I, I say I know personally leaders and I've worked with and for a lot of incredible leaders that are just chasing a massive vision and they're running fast and they're growing and they're doing amazing things and people just do get run over along the way. And a lot of them just you know, kind of have this attitude of, well, um, you know, whatever, like, you know, if they, if they can't keep, keep up, then, then get off, you know, like kind of like they, you know, they don't, they don't have the best attitude, but how do you, while running a, a fast growing or a high pressure style business, how do you, how do you find that? How do you make sure that high pressure doesn't turn into toxicity? Well, you need to check yourself and you need to be accountable to a small group of mature Christian people yep. who are going to keep you in the line. And, and I think one of the things that, that the kind of leader that you're talking about isn't very good at is, yep. to, is building that kind of framework around themselves just mm. to check their behaviour. So you by by nature they don't want to do that sort of thing because they are so committed to the vision. Often, of course, they're absolutely certain that they've got that vision from God and that God is going to hold them accountable for the outworking of that of that vision. But look, as a general rule, uh, except in times of disaster and war, I just don't like that sort of hero- what they used to call the the heroic man view of leadership. I, I think leadership is better based upon building an appropriate team. Yeah. And for the leaders of the kind that you've discussed, we're generally not talking about crisis or war. We're talking about building a vision. Yeah. And when God is involved, he loves people. Uh, God is not desiring that people get hurt as we make that journey towards the fulfillment of the vision that God has given us. But uh, I do think we have to be very wary of, of becoming the so-called heroic man type leader. Um, leaders do have to have vision because if they don't have vision and if they don't enthuse those around them in terms of that vision, it will never be achieved because God rarely gives somebody a vision that they can achieve on their own. I would counsel leaders to take time to build the right team. Mm-hmm. And uh, the leader, the, the kind of leader you're talking about I believe, but rarely has an appropriate 
two IC. The role of the mm-hmm. two IC is critically important, and is not talked enough about. It's not researched enough. Yeah. And uh, I've I've seen it work well once or twice, but once or twice only. Yeah. The kind of two IC has to be someone who doesn't have the same ambitions as the leader, because they've got to be absolutely uh, looking after the leader's back, so to speak. Yeah. Not looking for opportunities to lead in the same way themselves, either to usurp that leader or to move on to somewhere else. It has to be someone, in fact, whom God has called as two I see to that particular leader. And yes. I'm sure those people are out there. But look, when, when you study leadership, if you do leadership as part of a, a Bible college course or a university course, you will very rarely hear the role of the two I see even discussed. We yeah. focus on the leader, the leader, the leader all the time. And I think we probably do ourselves a disservice by doing that. Yeah, that's really good. Um, building that team around the right team around you is important and having the right two I C and and you're right, like the the right two I C is someone who could possibly do it by themselves but doesn't have the ambition to do it by themselves. I think that that's that's probably the crucial key. The another thing that comes to mind when we're talking about this this high pressure slash toxic environment, because I think that I think it's only a natural progression that if it's a high pressure environment, it becomes toxic. And the one thing that comes to my mind is one of the, one of the strategies that we we talk about a lot. And I know I have, actually I haven't done a free plug for this for a little while. A free plug for our free leadership development program. Link in description. Go check it out. Um, the the jarry window of urgent important that I find that most of those leaders that are running high pressure organizations are all operating in that urgent important quadrant and that's the biggest mistake as leaders that we are running in urgent important rather than in the not urgent important quadrant and that Go and go and look it up. The Jerry Window of urgent and important. It, it, you know, it, you'll find it anywhere. Because we tend to, most leaders that are running fast, that are chasing a big vision, don't take the time to plan and prepare properly. They're usually visionary, le- visionary leaders. That those are the types of leaders that tend to create a high pressure environment around them, and everyone's on the back foot, foot because they're just constantly trying to chase the next big idea that the leader has. And that's when leaders are operating in the, that urgent and important quadrant. When we're operating in that urgent or even the urgent side of the, of the uh, jarry window, then the, you, we're always gonna have high pressure because everything's urgent, Every, everything's last minute. Come on, we've gotta meet this deadline, gotta meet this deadline. However, if we as leaders operate in the important but not urgent quadrant, where we're focusing on the important things, we're prepared and we're doing them early enough. Now, it doesn't mean that nothing becomes urgent because sometimes emergencies happen. Sometimes things break down. Sometimes a client will come and say, I need this now. But if everything else is in the urgent important quadrant, then that's how you burn out your team. That's how in a high pressure business organization team, we get burnout. That's how they get, it becomes a toxic environment because we're always operating in that urgent important quadrant. And then when, when another urgent important thing comes up, that's almost like, as they say, the straw that broke the camel's back. So we as leaders need to focus on how do we operate more in that urgent, not important quadrant. So we're working on things early enough, we're prepared enough, planned enough. And as Dr. Rod mentioned earlier, when we're talking about one of the other topics is getting the right team around you. Because when you've got the right team around you, they're able to efficiently and proficiently do things in time rather than everything being maybe maybe there's too much work for a team to do and that's why everything's urgent so we need to be very careful of creating that toxic environment by creating a high pressure constant high pressure environment 
I think that's probably a good point to transition there, Dr. Rod. Um, <laughs> because talking about high pressure and a toxic environment, let's talk about exorcism. Now, I know this is this is a very, very, I wouldn't say a hot, a contentious topic. That's probably the right way to, to talk about it. But it was just, I don't know why, this, this clip that's linked down, I'll link down below, this clip actually was uh, about a year old, but it popped up in my feed. And then all of a sudden, you know, as the algorithms work, I'm seeing all this stuff on the Catholic Church and how they're actually working toward, you know, working on ex exorcisms and stuff like that. And this was an interview on uh, PBD podcast with Patrick Beck David, uh, with Father Vincent Lamp Lampert, um, who is a qualified uh, exorcist with the uh, with the Catholic Church. Now there was also then uh, an interview, Doctor Rod, that that you shared then between uh, Sean McDowell and uh, Richard McGallagher, which Richard McGallagher is a um, a psychologist that specialises in. Sorry, I was playing that on double speed because that's how I tend to watch things so I can consume as much information as possible in a short amount of time. Um, and he he actually works as a psychologist for um, you know, exorcisms and, and stuff like that. So links in description, go and watch those, very interesting. Dr. Rod, the first question I have for you is exorcisms possessions, stuff like that. It all sounds like things of movies. Does it actually happen? Short answer is yes, but rarely. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's the key. Yeah. And um, look, some people will probably turn off now. <laughs> uh, I do believe in demons. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen demons. I've had um, four encounters with demons that uh, that I can recall. Um, but I'm not afraid of demons. We don't have One to be. One was at my house. I remember yes. I was having uh, well, issues that at was, my house. And uh, that's yes, correct. helped me um, exercise my, one of them. My then. wife and I do appear to have been equipped by God to identify demons. And we've, we've done that for a number of our friends. And um, they're very easy to deal with because you just have to speak the name of Jesus and they've got to go. And I simply say to them, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And, and that's worked every time. Um, we can go into specific details if you wish. Well, but one, one thing I, I, I kind of want to jump on is one thing that I really liked that Richard emphasised is the difference between um, oppression and possession. Yes, you know, yes, do you want, yes. Do you want to explain those? Because I think that that actually gives some really good context to this, this interesting topic. Well, look, for Christians, um, we understand the idea that the Holy Spirit is within us. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're possessed by a demon, some people would call it a devil, then rather than having the Holy Spirit residing inside you and motivating you and so on, it's a demon or, or a devil. Yeah. Now, it's very, very rare. Uh, look, I, I've seen people who think they're, you know, getting rid of demons and so on, and they get pretty excited about it. But um, we'll talk a little bit yep. about <laughs> the way Jesus approached it, and I think yes. he's the model that we, we should use. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, one, one of the things that comes out in those videos, and like you, I would encourage people to watch those videos in full, especially the Sean McDowell one, which uh, runs for about an hour. But... Our understanding, my understanding of the human being as a Christian, as a pastor, is that we are tripartite. In other words, mm -hmm. we're body, we're soul, and we're spirit. Fundamentally, we're spiritual beings. We um, possess a soul, which is basically the mind, the emotions, and the will, and we live in a body at least at this point in yes. our existence, we, we live in a body. So look, when anyone presents uh, in, in such a way that may cause you to think they're possessed by, by a demon, as the Catholic Church does, they, they investigate body, soul and spirit before they are prepared to conclude that someone is actually possessed 
by a demon and therefore requires exorcism. Yeah. I also do like the Catholic approach. They don't video uh, yeah. any any orcsis, uh, exorc exorcism, <laughs> and uh, so they don't so they don't make anybody's names public or anything like that. And I think that's quite appropriate. Again, it's a it's a private issue, and I think it is something that should be left to people who have had some training uh, and have been with experienced exorcists. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do like the Catholic Church's approach. They they have a right, an, an rite of exorcism, and their practice is to check out, have somebody checked out physically, um, psychologically as well before they will even entertain the idea of um, exorcism. But look, uh, and I think it's very rare. I would have to say I, I wouldn't. I cannot think of an instance where I have ever drawn the conclusion that somebody is possessed by a demon. In other words, that they, they are being, their energy and their, their motive, if you like, is entirely demonic. Mm -hmm. In terms of being oppressed by demons, that's a different story. I think many of us are. I believe I have been myself. Um, but that's different because, in a sense, that's not internal. That's an external force that we're having to cope with. But it can lead to things like uh, depression and anxiety, perhaps also to anger, uh, disappointment, and, and so on. It can cause us to sabotage our own success. So mm -hmm. I think it's much more likely that a Christian is going to be um, oppressed by demons but for a christian in whom the holy spirit resides there's no room for a demon mm -hmm. uh, and that's it that would be my general advice people who are demon possessed would normally be people who are deeply engaged in that which is satanic and they've invited uh, satanic forces to actually predominate in the in their lives yeah, but generally i let me just jump on that for a moment with a question because the devil doesn't have authority unless we give him any authority. Well, no, no. And, and look, the devil and the demons, just got to remember the devil himself is just a fallen angel. Yeah, uh, so too often, one. look, he's too often, one. absolutely, <laughs> too often as Christians, we kind of have God and the devil somehow on the same level. Mm -hmm. God is the one who's omniscient, omnipresent, right, and omnipotent. Satan isn't. Mm -hmm. Satan isn't. Satan is just one fallen angel who happens to be leading a band of, I don't know how many other fallen angels, the Bible tells us, one third of the angels, but I don't know how many angels there are, so I can't tell you what one third of the angels is. But what I can say is uh, demonic activity is mm -hmm. certainly evident. Uh, in the earth today. There's no doubt about that. In my mind, I, I do believe that's the case. And um, I've seen demons. Uh, I've dealt with demons. And I've had an occasion where I believe there was a demon who was trying to kill me. And the reason why I say that is that God told me that if I hadn't dealt with that demon, it would have killed me. Now, that might spook some people. Some people might now um, decide Rodson Hill's an idiot or, or dreaming or whatever. That's fine and dandy. I have no problem with that. That's certainly uh, your choice. But um, I, I do think as a Christian that, that, that I, I am aware that there is a lot of demonic activity uh, in the world and uh, demons, as it were, have permission to be active through sin. And yep. uh, there is sin in the world. Sin mars everything. And uh, therefore demonic activity can be expected in every human endeavor. Yeah. Now, just to put a leadership spin on, like I want to kind of now now convert this. Now, obviously, leaders aren't leaders aren't. Hopefully, like you say, it's not that common possession. Not that common. Um, but the reason why why this kind of attracted me, especially with this topic, was the fact that we may be leading someone who is seeming to be oppressed by something right like 
even let's 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 leave the word demon aside or whatever. But the, you know, like you say, there's depression, there's there's anxiety, there's stress, there's there, there's something that's holding them down. What can we learn from this story about you know how how they approach uh, exorcism to we as leaders? How do we now we shouldn't be going around to our employees and sprinkling them with holy water and and casting demons out of it. But like, how do we how do we lead someone who is seemingly being oppressed by something? Look, you know, I think that as it were that multi stage process that the Catholic Church and others engage in is probably the wisest thing to do. Now, look, yep. I'm a pastor. I do not have a degree in psychology or I'm not a psychiatrist. There are many things I'm not, which means there are many things I shouldn't try to be. Mm -hmm. But this one thing I do understand as a pastor is that we are tripartite beings. And if somebody presents with a seemingly um, very serious issue that manifests in unusual behaviours or unusual speech, then I would want to encourage them. We need to check them out bodily, that is physically, as well as in the, the soul area, that's the Greek word there is suki. And uh, psychology is about soul care. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure that there's not a psychological or psychiatric issue. So in other words, the symptoms I observe may be consistent with demon possession, but that doesn't mean there actually is demon possession. Mm -hmm. So we need, we need, I think, to be aware we're body, soul and spirit, and we need to look at these issues in terms of the fact that human beings are tripartite beings. So we, I, I would encourage somebody to um, be checked out physically as well as uh, emotionally to see so, whether or not. Yeah, I, th I think that I, what I want to what I want to kind of delve into is, or kind of mention, is it may not be to that extreme of like demonic oppression, but like we as leaders, mostly will, you know, we will come across someone who's depressed. We come across people that are, that are stressed and anxious, and I think that there's there's kind of like now we shouldn't automatically then diagnose those people as being, oh, they're oppressed, they've got demons. Oh, I, I, that's why I'm kind of wanting to distance that and use this as more of a metaphor, but we are all coming across people that are stressed, that are, have anxiety, that have depression, that are going through some struggle, struggles in their life that are oppressing them from performing at their best or living their best life. And I actually feel like there's some really good uh, lessons from this, you know, from the exorcism story that we can do as leaders. And I think, Dr. Rod, you mentioned it, like we are need, first of all, we need to understand what our limitations are. Like we as leaders are, can't be the, the all. And I think that sometimes there are a lot of caring leaders out there, especially leaders that are real natural mentors and caring people and maybe like pastoral, if you want to kind of talk about it as a gift, that they can get caught up with trying to be the all answer for that person. But I think the lesson we can learn from this story is let's let's make understand that there are those there are the three different there there is mind, body and soul, you know, um and sorry, spirit, body and soul. I get so caught up with the with the new age way of like mind, body, and soul. It's like, hold on a second, no, mind is soul. Uh, spirit, body, and soul. And if there's someone we know, that a friend, an employee, someone we're mentoring, mentoring uh, a, a, a congregation member, or whatever, someone that we're leading that is showing signs of depression, of, of, of anxiety, or whatever, Remember that there's there are it should be a three pronged attack. We can't be all three. They should see their pastor. They should see a psychologist, and they should see a doctor because it might just be a dietary thing. It might just be that they you know that there's something going on in their body that they just need to get an operation on that just changes their whole 
you know, like like I've got gut issues and I found out that the gut issues that I have are actually messing with my serotonin levels in my body. So I need to manage my serotonin levels. And that actually that actually completely changes my, my mindset and everything like that. It is because I've got gut issues, right? So just a physical thing. Um, you got to see a psychologist. I have a psychologist on our on our board on my, on my board of advisors. I have a psychologist. She's a friend of mine. Um, she mentors me more as a friend that has experience as a psychologist. I also see another psychologist. Um, I've always seen psychologists. I like. I think that they're a great help. There's no embarrassment for you to go and see someone. I think we all need that help. And you should have a pastor or someone that is speaking into that spiritual side of your life as well. If you or someone you're leading seems to be feeling oppressed through emotions or something that they're suffering, we've got to do the full three-pronged approach to, to approach everything. And trust me, you may be really gifted, but I doubt you can cover all of those areas successfully. And so it's good to get a team involved to be able to help uh, approach those challenges. So that's a that's a great lesson that we can take out of here. But let's now look how. How does Jesus respond to demonic possession? Let's open up and let's go into our segment called Leadership Lessons from Luke. And today we are going to go to uh, we're going to go to Luke chapter four, verses thirty one from verse thirty one. And yeah, it's a short passage, so why not read it all? And we're just going to look at when we're talking about exorcism and we're talking about you know possession and people that we're dealing with. Like how does how does the ultimate leader how does how does God Himself respond? Listen to this from verse thirty one. Then he went down to uh, Capernaum in a a town in Galilee and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed by his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, actually, I find this very interesting. His response, first of all, was like, shh, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. And then, quite simply, come out of him. That was it. Then the demon threw the man down uh, down before all of them and came out without injuring him, which I think is interesting. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What is this teaching? What, with, uh, with authority and power, he gives orders to evil spirit and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Obviously, Dr. Rod, the key to that is we're talking about exorcism and everything like that. How do you, how do you respond to an attack to the devil? Like, okay, we're talking about accusations today. How do you respond to accusations? Or, or, or you know, obviously, the the demonic beings were 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 accusing against Jesus. What do you do? Just with authority, said, "Come out." Dr. Well, Rod. we've got the same authority. And um, we, how? If, if, let, let me like yes, it's that's actually very. I mean, as a Christian, we say it all the time. But I want you as as my pastor and as the everyone and the business pastor. Everyone's watching you. You are now their anointed pastor for a moment. Um, teach us. What is it? Give give me the the substance to why it's like oh yeah, sure. pretty simple. Well, I've got authority. Why you got authority in the name of Jesus? Every Christian does. Every Christian does because we've been ad- adopted into God's family. We're siblings of Jesus, as far as God is concerned, and we have the same inheritance as Jesus does. And I would take that to mean that we also have the power. That does not make us God, by the way. (laughs) It doesn't make us God, but it does mean that we have delegated authority Mm -hmm. and we can use that authority over demons. Um, In preparing for for today, I actually did some reading around 
yeah. those um, those scriptures because, of course, in ancient times, they didn't have the same understanding that we have today about what causes disease, including um, psychological illnesses. And basically everything was ascribed to evil spirits, <laughs> yep. you see. Now, if you read on in that story, of course, um, Jesus actually upset the people and one of the reasons for that undoubtedly was that they had their ways of dealing with these kinds of symptoms and it usually involved incantations of one kind or another and sometimes also strong odours. I read that in a, in a commentary. They weren't used to somebody simply using the authority and saying, be quiet, come out. So what Jesus did was radically different. Now, also in my reading, I've come to understand that this almost certainly was someone who was possessed by a demon. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really doubt the literal um, sense in which this is recorded. And I think for what we can take great comfort from is that it wasn't hard to deal with it because yes. in the face of God's truth, the demon has to go. And this is the, the way in which I've dealt with demons. I know as a Christian that at the name of Jesus, the devil has to flee. Well, if the devil has to flee, then so do all his henchmen and women, mm -hmm. if, if um, angels have sex. Um, so, and, and look, in the cases where, where I've uh, been confronted by, by demons, that's exactly what I've done. I've simply said this, in the name of Jesus, go, and every time they've gone, mm -hmm. every single time, I was once faced with, with, with what you might call a mob of demons. This was in a workplace. And um, that's I was not a nice my... way to talk about your colleagues, Dr. Roy. Right? <laughs> no, it wasn't my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of them were probably possessed, but anyway. Um, <laughs> It was interesting because I was in my office and I just felt the, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up and you get that, it, it, that sensation, it's an electrifying sensation. Now, it was quite late at night, but I'm absolutely convinced I wasn't hallucinating. Mm. I walked out and in the, in the public space, it was just seething with, with these demons. And um, because I know the Word of God, I just looked at these things and I said, in the name of Jesus, be gone. Mm. And they just went out through the front door. They didn't open the door. They just went through the front door, the, the whole lot of them. Mm. Um, so, look, I just don't think we have to be afraid of them. And Jesus certainly wasn't afraid. And he simply said, be quiet, come out of him. And the demon so simply had to obey. So what's the difference then? Because you know, actually, we kind of alluded to it in mm. our previous story that we we're talking about. But the showmanship of of you know, you see in charismatic you know, evangelical churches and and stuff like that that you know th there's a song and dance and come out and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, look, so, um, you know, uh, it's not common. That's not a common practice in the evangelical and Pentecostal churches. There are. There are some uh, preachers who do it. Um, who knows, they might have special discernment that there actually are demons in these people. And see, often it won't be a regular attender. It will be, when, when I've seen this sort of thing happen, it's somebody who's come in who shows no signs that they are actually Christians. Mm. And they could well have been deep, deep, deep in the occult before they came in. I think those are the kinds of people who may well be possessed by demons. But there are a very small number who either make a living out of it or who claim that this is their sort of specialisation. And I would have to say I'm sceptical about that. Mm -hmm. Look, I come from a denomination where it, 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 even if I was the designated exorcist, I wouldn't be charging people because that's not that's not our culture. Mm. We 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 don't charge people for running weddings or funerals or anything. We don't charge people 
for for counsel or or support we, we just don't do that it's not part of our culture and it's not part of the culture of most evangelical yeah. and pentecostal churches either what we see on television we need to take with a grain of salt because we're not actually there as a as a, observers and my my impression is that there are not very many people at all who make this a practice where where i've observed it i've I've, I've never felt that i've been praying for anybody who's been possessed by a demon and i do believe it is very very rare but where i have seen pastors a couple of times in a church that i was attending regularly uh, it has always been somebody who's not a regular attender at that church and who most likely has been dabbling in the occult before they've you know, been wooed by the Holy Spirit to come into the church uh, for salvation. And uh, demons don't like to see people saved anyway. Mm -hmm. So what about you? Because you talk about times of, of being able to... Uh, cast out demons and stuff like you just speak to them. like you as you were saying like rather like you've you've experienced some demon demons around you and you just tell them to leave like just calmly but confidently and that's it i think about those times when my, my, my son i'll be sitting there and my son will be sick and and you know there's there's that there's that very typical of like you know, devil, get your hands off my son, and you know, like, like, you know, because sickness is from the devil and the demonic, you know, like, obviously in that time he's sick. I don't believe that he is oppressed or depressed, and I'm not seeing demonic beings around, but, you know, I know it's a fact of sin and stuff like that. So I, I suppose my mind went to, like, you talking to those demons and, cast, and casting them out and just telling them leave. I just kind of wanted to emphasize that I think we can get caught up into thinking of like, well, someone's sick. They got they they got demons, and the 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 demons are making them sick. And now I need to I need to speak with an authority. And why when why do when I speak to them and they don't get better straight away and and, and things like that. So, what what would you say to people that are really praying? Because demonic spirits kind of seems like. I don't know, if you go to hierarchy of, of issues, you're sick here, demonic spirits are kind of up there. And if you could just speak to a demonic spirit and just tell him out, wouldn't that mean that the same thing happens to someone who's sick, like to sickness? And shouldn't I be able to cast out that <laughs> sickness? And so why is it that then no matter how much I pray, no matter how much I do a song and dance and chant and, and whatever and shout Jesus' name, that person does, it doesn't get better. A lot of reasons for that, and we probably need a whole a whole podcast to address those issues, and I, I've, I've taught on that in my, in my own church. Uh, healing can sometimes be a process, but in, in, in relation to demonic oppression, influence and, and possession and, and so on, I, I don't think it's terribly productive for us, as it were, to be addressing Satan mm -hmm. and jumping up and down and saying, Satan, take your hand off this person. Because how do you know Satan's there? Remember, Satan is one fallen angel and he's not omnipresent. Yes. Okay. So he's not necessarily going to hear you anyway. What I would say is focus on the truth of the word of God that says, by the stripes that Jesus bore, we are healed. Mm. Focus on things like the confession in Psalm 103. Forget not the Lord and all of his benefits. You know, he's the God who heals us. So when I pray for people, I, 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 I tend not to sort of... I, I acknowledge that sickness isn't from God. My, my own theological position is that nothing bad comes from God, that everything bad is the result of sin, the cosmic result of sin often, sometimes the direct result of our own sin, ignorance or stupidity. But the broken body of Jesus Christ provides for our healing physically, in, in our body and our soul actually. Um, we, we probably don't often sort of reflect on this, but I think the crown of thorns that Jesus bore, that, that, was, that is what has delivered 
healing psychologically in other words healing of the soul so the the um, the terrible scourging that he suffered which would have exposed his internal organs that was the provision for the healing of our bodies the crown of thorns um, my understanding from having done a lot of re reading i haven't done original research but i've read books by people who have the thorns on that crown would have actually penetrated into his brain and caused unbelievable excruciating pain that i believe is what has wrought for us healing of our souls the the mind the will and the emotions so healing body and soul was provided for on the cross healing spirit, spiritually comes through regeneration when we become a new creation when our spirit being is 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 renewed um, and then the the general provision for living a prosperous life including a prosperous life in terms of our health that comes through the new covenant where god has provided for us prosperity in every area of our lives through the new covenant, this covenant that Paul called a better covenant because it was a covenant that was based on the grace of God. Once we understand that, then our, our faith really is our natural, if you like, our natural response to what God has provided by grace. So when, when the Bible says, when in 2 Peter, um, we are reminded that by his stripes we are healed, we are and i think that's what we need to stand on in prayer um but look sometimes sometimes healing takes a bit of time and we don't always know the reasons for that i, I know my wife was very very sick some years ago and of course i prayed for her every day i prayed for her regularly and i remember in uh, february of one year God gave me one word and it was vitality mm. and I just stood on that word and I stood on that word and I stood on that word and um, she actually got a diagnosis about six months later which was great because uh, that gave me something specific to pray against and let me tell you she was a woman who she had the gait of a 90 year old back in those days we're talking a little while ago now um 2004 to be exact but uh, i'll tell you what she's she's a healed person now and she's been healed from a disease which is genetic we're not supposed yeah. to be healed <laughs> of those sorts of diseases um but but i stood on that word i believe i got that word from the lord and she's certainly full of vitality and has been now for many years. Um, so it works. And I'm not, I, I am, I suppose, in a minority. I would probably be described by some people as a word of faith person. Mm -hmm. I've got great respect for ministries like Kenneth Copeland Ministries. I've been a supporter of them for many, many years. And, um, you know, others like them. And uh, I, I don't believe that God waits until we die before we're healed. I don't think we have to wait until we die. I think healing is the privilege of the born again, spirit filled Christian. But what if we do? What if they do? What if they do what? Die. Okay, yeah. look, I know this is very controversial, but this is what I would say, and this is the way I deal with things like that. I cannot give you a reason. I may know when I get to heaven, but I may not be interested by then anyway. Yeah. We cannot always know the whys and the wherefores. There are a number of factors, including the faith and desire of the person for whom we're praying and our own faith or, and also um, unbelief. I think faith and unbelief are slightly different, different things. Yeah. But this is what I would say. I don't allow my experience to determine my my theology. I mm. base my theology on the Bible. I use the Bible as the final arbiter on all matters concerning Christian faith and practice. My Bible tells me that through the body and the blood of Jesus, I have healing. Mm. And so I stand on that word. 
And uh, yes, I've prayed for people who have died. In some cases, I know that in the end, their desire was that they didn't want to fight anymore. They wanted to die. That's okay. And I think God's pretty okay with that too. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't condemn anybody who just decides I'm tired and I just want to go home. And of course, I'm sure you and many people watching this podcast have read about people who made that decision. They've, they've read testimonies. And in some cases, when they've had out-of-body experiences, for example, they've heard the Lord say, you can choose to come home or you can choose to go back into your body and continue on earth. And they've made that choice. So this is not to condemn anybody. I just hope that I might build up people's faith I I won't allow my experience to determine my theology or my doctrine. Um, if I do, then I'm going to have the, the wonkiest doctrine under the sun. Um, I, I, I build it on the Word of God because I trust in the Word of God. I believe that reveals God's will generally for, for everybody, and I believe that's where truth resides not in my experience or somebody else's experience. That's really good, Dr. Rowe. Thank you for sharing that. I, I actually feel like that's a perfect place for us to to end. I don't actually want to co cap that off with anything. I, I think that's beautiful, and thank you for sharing that. Um, hey, if you enjoyed this, give it a thumbs up. Um, we appreciate you watching. I noticed there's been a bunch of comments coming through. Thank you for your comments. Um, Sorry, I can't really read them at, at the time. But uh, yeah, make, let's make, if you can give us a like, you know, it'll help. Uh, and you know what? If you want to see more of this stuff, uh, consider subscribing to our channel for more faith-based leadership uh, content. Uh, we appreciate you and hope that you have learnt your best. Dr. Rod, thank you. Thank you so well, much for sharing tonight. Thank tonight you was for having more me. about more about uh, me just quizzing you tonight. I was uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of lot of really good conversations. So thank you so much, um, and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Next week, where we do our one year anniversary, and that we should are be going fun. to be reacting to yep, some of our, be great our, our most yep. viral videos. Well, mini viral, our most let's say the most watched ones. Let's just say that. We're still young, but hey, we'd love your help to get the word out. Share share this out with people. Subscribe and uh, give us a like. But thank you. We hope that you've learned from this. I hope that some of this, uh, some of our conversation today has helped you discover how you can become a better leader. And I hope that you continue to learn, live, and lead on purpose. Have a spectacular week.